in Exodus chapter 3 this morning. If you'd like to join us on our quest, uh, book of Exodus is a quest story, and uh, maybe we'll do communion in a moment too, I don't know. Yeah. Um, Exodus 3 is a quest story, or Exodus, the book of Exodus is, and it's a quest for God's holiness. That's, that's what they were looking for. Uh, that's especially when you get to the end of the book and it starts to describe in great detail the Ark of the Covenant and how they built all of that. And that's the, the tabernacle is where God's presence on earth was uh, housed in essence, although we know he told Solomon that he can't fit within a house. But that, that was the house that they made for him. And, uh, and so you kind of see the first half is more narrative as they try to get closer to God's presence, and that's a theme that's throughout. And the second half is that the literal building of the house for God's presence. And so uh, you have here a quest for God's presence, or you call it holiness, because that's what's required to be in God's presence is holiness. And so we started looking, last time we looked at chapters 1 and 2, and, and talked about how chapters 1 through 4, in essence, is a quest for the fear of God, and that is fear over other things. And so 1 and 2 we talked about being uh, a quest to, uh, to, you know, was Moses going to fear God? Or was he going to fear man more than God, comparing, looking at Pharaoh and, and uh, the events in that chapter? But in chapter 3 and 4, Exodus 3 and 4, the big question today that Moses is uh, facing, that we'll ask about Moses, that the text seems to ask about him is, will Moses choose what's, choose what's comfortable to him? Will he choose the paths that he's used to, or will he choose God's path? Because the, the kind of theme throughout is, fearing God instead of change. And that's, I think three and four are very telling of human nature. You know, one and two focuses on fearing uh, God over man. And that seems to be sometimes some of our biggest struggles is why we don't obey God is because we're afraid of other people, especially if they have authority over us or if we care a lot about what they think. But three and four deals with, with not humans, but with changes that we have to make in order to be close to God, in order to have holiness, to be in his presence. And so as we go through three and four, the question that they would have been asking, if you'd never read it before, was will Moses choose change, or will he choose what he's used to, what he's comfortable with? And so starting in chapter three, you have especially fear of the people who will judge you if you change. That's, I remember when I was in high school, I, uh, I was not a sharp dresser, you know. You know, there were like the cool kids in high school, then there were those of us who looked like we had been dressed in a closet in the dark, you know, and that, that was me. I was not a sharp dresser. And you know, one day I looked up and I was unaware of this. And so I, it's, I don't remember what it was, but it hit me. It's like, I don't dress like everybody else. I look different. And I could see clearly in that moment what I could wear that would make me look like everyone else. But I had never really worn stuff like that before. Not that it was bad or anything, it just hadn't occurred to me. And I was so afraid of what people would think of me if I dressed in a different way than I had before, even though it would make it easier to fit in, but I just kept wearing the weird stuff because, you know, I, I was so afraid of what they would think about me. It's amazing what people will not do or what people will keep doing because they're afraid of what others will think about them, the judgment that they're going to receive, even if we're not dealing with matters of right and wrong. Moses is dealing with some weightier things than his clothes in Exodus chapter 3, and dealing with the fear of those who judge you if you change versus the fear of him who commands change. And that's who God is in this chapter. It starts in verses 1 through 6 with a look at who God is. And it says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert. I love that. He went a long, long way and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of the bush, and so he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. And so, of course, Moses is astonished and amazed at this, and he thinks to himself, I'd like to know more about that. And so, verse 4, uh, the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, and God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And so, I'm sure he was stunned, but, you know, he says, here I am. <laughs> and verse 5, he says, do not draw near this place. And that's key. It's interesting, because the whole book is about drawing closer to God. But in the beginning of the story, Moses can't get any closer. That's what God says. Don't get any closer than you already are. And in fact, he has changes to make. He has to take his sandals off because the place that he's standing is holy ground. And so he says then in verse 6, I am the God of your father. I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And so Moses hid his face. Now you remember later 
in Exodus and Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Moses goes to see God, and he comes down, and his face is shining. Remember, he has to put a veil over it because it's so bright, people can't look at him. So if he wants to you know, have a regular conversation, he's got to put a veil so he doesn't blind the people who are looking at him. It's like looking at the sun. And it says there that he saw God, in a sense, face to face. But at the beginning of Moses' story, he is so afraid to look that he covers his face. And so we'll start to see really this transition in Moses. But it says that uh, he covered his face for he was afraid to look upon God. And so right from the start, we see here he is afraid of God. Now here's some things that we notice about God. In verse 1, it's called the mountain of God. And the idea is you have to climb to get to where God is. Now that's really sort of a word picture, but you have to climb to get to where God is. And that's what Isaiah and the Psalms say, right? God is higher. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. In uh, verse 2, we see how powerful God is, that he is a, a consuming fire, but if he wants to, he can be a consuming fire that doesn't consume anything. Now that's, that's like consuming fire is very powerful. It, you know, not, not many more things can destroy to the level that a wildfire can, you know, when it comes through a forest or through fields. It, it can completely destroy, but a fire that can choose when to burn things up and when not to burn things up, that's like extra level, you know. Yes, ma'am. I was just thinking right here that, you know, this was frightening because Moses, in Moses' time, no one had heard from God sure. for hundreds of years. So it wouldn't have been something that he heard from his, you know, his grandparents or parents or whatever that, you know, God talked to a friend when they did. Right. This was something that had not happened in probably 400 years. Which yeah, it's been some time, yeah. So, you know, we, the last time that we really see God communicating directly with people is Joseph at the end of the book of Genesis. And we know there's, there's some generations in between Joseph, and that's back in chapter 1. It talks about how Joseph and that whole generation died, and, and, uh, and the next Pharaoh doesn't even know Joseph. So, you know, some time has gone by, and, uh, and so certainly Moses knew about God. Certainly he had been taught by his mother for the first few years about God. Certainly he cared about God's people. That was evident in chapter 2. But likely, you know, he hasn't really, no one has heard directly from God like we're used to in the book of Genesis. And so just hearing voices out of inanimate objects is not everyday normal things for us or for Moses. And so imagine how you would feel, and that's how Moses felt. And so uh, he, he is powerful. Verses 3 through 5 really emphasize how God is holy. That is, he's, he is separate. He's, he is uh, uh, different from everything else. He's unique in every possible way from anything else that exists. And that's, you know, see that he, Moses can't get any closer. There's got to be some space because he's holy. He can't wear the sandals there because it's holy ground. And then in verse 6, I think this is the most important part, that God is a God of relationship, of covenant, of connection, that though they haven't heard from him in a while, um, he, uh, he cares about them and he hasn't forgotten them. He's connected to them. And so that's the introduction to this story of, about chapter 3 and 4, is a, a big picture, real fast look at who, the, who God is. Now, he is then going to go through some, some, some of Moses' questions and, and excuses and concerns in order to give us the other side of the picture, the people who he's afraid that will judge him, the people who he's afraid will notice the changes that he's making. But it starts with who God is. So that you get this big picture kind of breathtaking view of why it's worth it to make those changes and that God is communicating that in subtle ways to Moses even from the very beginning. Any thoughts or comments on that so far? Okay, so we pick up then in verse 7 and here uh, all the way to verse 22, 7 to 22, the end of the chapter, uh, it's going to focus on what I kind of call the crowds, right? So that's, you know, the the nameless crowds who, y'all have those, uh, those, you know, you say things like, well, they're going to think this about me if I do that. And has anyone ever asked, like, who? And you're like, oh, I'm not sure who. But they're going to think that, you know. You just, you just get afraid of the, the, the judgment or the voices that you're afraid, and you realize you don't even know who's going to say that. Hey, this is the crowds. And in particular, uh, he's concerned about Pharaoh and the Egyptians and what they're going to think about him. But then he's also concerned about the Israelites and what they're going to say and think about him. And so he's got these two camps, these two crowds that he's dealing with. And notice, just like in the last chapters, there are these contrasts built in. Verse 7, the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. 
I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and large land, a land flowing with milk and honey, place of, and he lists all the people who live there. Verse 9, Therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen and, uh, the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. And so notice how God is describing Pharaoh and the Egyptians. They're oppressive people. Uh, they're, they're condemning and, and putting down God's people. Uh, they're, not, they're not the kind of people that you, uh, uh, that you really want to spend a lot of time with, I would think. But isn't it true that sometimes the people whose opinion we care about the most are the loudest and, and uh, uh, ugliest people, not ugly like from a physical perspective, but you know their attitude, their, their perspective is ugly, the way they treat people is ugly. The, the loudest and, and ugliest people in the room tends to be the ones that we listen to, the ones that we, well, if I do this, you know, she's going to say that about me because you know they're going to call you out. You know they're going to say something. You know they're going to make fun of you. You know that they're going to make you feel bad. You know, those people tend to be the ones that are the voices in the back of our minds telling us, now you can't make that change because someone's going to notice and then she's going to say, and Moses is just like us in that sense. Verse 11, Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? But God says, I will certainly be with you. That seems to be a theme throughout the Bible. Yes, ma'am. Yes. So before we even get to verse 11, God has already told him that he is going to be. Yes. So just like us, sometimes we forget that God's in charge because he turns it into a human issue. Right. Because he said, who am I that I should go do it? Well, you're not. Right. So God's the one in charge. He's using you, but he's the one. He's already told you that he's going to do it. It's going to happen. And so I feel like this is a, a good parallel to us many times. Yes. We put this on me, 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 me. I go do this. Oh, I can't do this. Poor people, me. Right. But God has already clearly stated that he was going to be the one who did it. He was just going to use Moses yes. to do it. Yes, Moses gets the honor of being the tool that in God's belt for this task, and that's that's an honor, that's a blessing, and that's you know, Paul. Paul kind of talks about this when he says, uh, you know, when I am weak, that's when God is strong. Or you know, I asked God to take the thorn away. I felt limited. I felt like I couldn't do what I should. I couldn't do enough. And God says, My grace is sufficient. Right? I'm going to take care of the things that are outside of your control, and I'm the one that's really working behind the scenes to make all of this happen. Do you think so, Moses felt like he was in no man's land? He had turned his back on the Egyptians. Yes. He was raised there mm-hmm. you know, in a priestly way for them. I mean, their hierarchy. Right. Plus, he wasn't hasn't been in with the Hebrews long enough for them to understand really who he was either. Sure. Because they remember him just as Egyptian. Yes. But yet now he turned his back on. But now he's he's between both groups. I think that's and that's where a lot of his excuses I think come from because he started out, like you said, with the Egyptians. <clears throat> Why am I going before these Egyptians? And then he turns in, well, uh, how do I go to these Hebrews? Because he asks, who do I tell them you are? Yes, yes. And I think that's exactly it. He's, he feels rejected by both. And so he's kind of the man with no home, right? No no people, no family. And that's he's gone to Midian, which is far, far away. And he's married a woman there, and he has a father-in-law who he likes. And, and I think Moses is just thinking, these are my people. You know, I, I just give all the rest of it up. And so now God is saying, you're going to go back to the place where nobody likes you. And he's thinking... I don't want to go where both sides hate me so much, where I'm in no man's land. I think that's that's a good point. Well, I think that you know, this is God's infinite wisdom. That's exactly who he needed. Yes. He understood both sides. Both sides. There's a nice parallel to Jesus there. <laughs> was there a hand in here? Yes. Yeah. I don't know, but I got a feeling Moses was scared if that was the same Pharaoh, because when Moses left, he left for a reason because mm-hmm. he was scared of Pharaoh because he had killed two of those Egyptians. Yes, yeah. And that Pharaoh was out to kill him. Mm-hmm. So I don't know how many years had gone by. We know it's enough that he had to really put his trust in God to yes. go back to a place where, if Pharaoh is king, I go back. He's gonna kill me. Yeah. I think, I think that you're spot on. We, we know it's enough time that the original Pharaoh has died. That's what chapter 2 tells us. He had died. But it really is regardless. Your point stands either way because even this new Pharaoh, whether he's familiar with Moses or not, what you end up getting because of the nature of what God is asking him to do is from their perspective, God against God. Right? Because Pharaoh was billed as a God. He was billed as, as divine, the yeah. son of a God. And then, of course, you have the true God. And so, you know... Uh, the, the point still stands because you have you have this uh, I am coming from a different God from Pharaoh's perspective. We know there's not a different God, but from Pharaoh's perspective, Moses says I'm coming from a different God, 
to take these people away from your authority. And this God is saying, you know, I'm not going to allow that. And so he's in a sticky situation either way. There's a lot of fear, I think, and that's, that's, I think, why you see the word fear show up so much in these chapters. They're looking for a good excuse not to... That's just Do right, yeah. He's got plenty of them. And so he, he continues then, and uh, in verse 12 he says, I will be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. And so uh, there's this, um, this sort of promise that he makes. But notice the contrast. There's oppressive Pharaoh, oppressive Egyptians, and then how God describes himself. He's a deliverer. He frees them. And again, he emphasizes in verses 11 and 12 his connection, his relationship, his covenant with them. And so, uh, you know, he's kind of trying to help Moses break it down. Whose opinion matters more to you? These people who are oppressive, the loud ones who are going to, you know, judge you and you can see it on their faces, right? That's the worst when you can see it on somebody's face and you know they're thinking something ugly about you. Or God, whose face you can't see, right? He hid his face from God. But who is a deliverer, who has a relationship with you, who has a connection with you, which one are you going to emphasize? Then in verse 13, Moses has a new thing. He says to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your father has sent me to you. And they say to me, Well, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And so kind of the emphasis here is he's afraid that these Israelites are really unbelievers, that they're doubters, that they're not going to believe. And so verse 14, God says this, uh, you know, one of the most famous verses in the whole Bible, I am who I am. And if this were a different kind of Bible class and we were not trying to keep up with the other Bible classes, we would spend a lot of time just right here. But for today, we're going to keep moving so that we can uh, keep up with the others, which I think is a good and important thing. And so he says, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham. And this is what the third time that God has restated this. This is God's emphasis. I have a connection, a relationship with you. Verse 14, his point is, he's unchanging and eternal. The Israelites are fickle, aren't they? That's the idea of verse 13. They're fickle. They go this way and that way with the wind. Sometimes they believe and sometimes they're doubters. But verse 14, God is unchanging and eternal. He's always been and he never will change. He always will be. He's connected to them. Verses 16 and 17, he says, Go, gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, this is the fourth time maybe that he said it, appeared to me saying, I have surely visited you and seen what is done to you in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of all these people, a land flowing with milk and honey. And so verse, uh, again, he emphasizes that he's a deliverer. And then verses 18 and 19 are interesting. It says, then you will heed your voice. They will heed your voice. You shall come, you and the elders of Israel, to the king of Egypt, and you shall say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. And now, please, let us go three days' journey into the wilderness, so we may sacrifice to the Lord your, our God. But I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go, no, not even by a mighty hand. And so, you think, what, what's the contrast that he's building here? God is saying, I know everything. I'm all-knowing. I can tell you exactly, you know, that's, that's sometimes what's so fearful about change, is just the uncertainty of exactly what people are going to say. The uncertainty of exactly how they're going to phrase their judgment or exactly how they're going to look down on you. You're just, sometimes what's so scary about change is just the unknown of what follows change. And so God wipes that away too. And he says, you don't even have to wonder what's coming. Here's exactly how the conversation is going to go. I can see it as if it's already happened because I know everything. And if I know everything, then I know that it all works out in the end. And he'd already told them back that, that already just a few verses ago, right? When this is done, you will bring all the people back here to this mountain, and you will worship me. So he's already given them the big picture in, but now he's giving them the little details along the way to take away some of that doubt, to help him overcome his fear of those who judge him. And then verses 21 to 22, he emphasizes that they will ultimately be victorious over these people. And so... If you're going to take all of their belongings, verse 22, if you're going to, if you're going to, to win, why do you care what they think about you? Whose opinion do you care about more? The God who gives you victory and riches and strength, or the Pharaoh who can do nothing against that God? Which, which one do you choose? Any thoughts or comments before we jump into chapter 4? Yes. I kind of think that all of it comes down to identity. 
Okay. Good. Yeah, I think I think that's. Uh, I'm glad that you went there. Is that a really important point of chapter three? And she she was mentioning how you notice the idea of identity comes up several times. Moses says, "Who am I?" And he's really asking God with his name, "Who are you?" And that he knows who Pharaoh is. Right? Oh, Pharaoh has a very determined identity that has been passed down for generations. You know, and then the Israelites have a sense of community, and the Egyptians have a sense of community. But but as Johnny mentioned, Moses is a lost man. He doesn't have an identity with any real culture, and even Jethro, you know, he's not even related to him technically, and so he's not grounded firmly in that. He doesn't have a strong sense of who he is, but sometimes, or really sometimes, we care too much what other people think about us, and we don't feel confident in who we are, and and so he's, Moses is giving him that sense of identity. All that really matters today, Moses, is you are the one that I'm sending. That's your identity, and if you can build your identity around that, then those voices kind of melt away that, that you know, tell you, well, if you change, they're going to do this, or they're going to say that, and that, that frighten you so much. A, a confident person who's confident in the identity God has given them can overcome those voices much easier than someone who's too concerned, uh, who doesn't really have a good sense of that, and therefore becomes too concerned with what other people think. That's a really good point. All right, chapter four. So we started with God. We moved on to the crowds. What do all the crowds think? Now in chapter four, and I think this is what Sarah was getting at, He's really going to focus on his own sense of self and really his own doubts about himself, not what other people are saying, but what he is telling himself. And that's, you know, the phrase, I'm my own worst critic. That's, that's sort of the idea here of sometimes your sense of reality is false because you can't see yourself accurately. You can't see yourself the way that God sees you. And, you know, uh, Jesus says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. The way that God sees you is the real way that you are. And so if you can't see it that way, then you have a false sense of reality that will skew what you're able to do. So it starts in chapter 4 and verse 1. Moses answered and said, Okay, suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, the Lord has not appeared to you. Right. So it really, in essence, as we'll see in a moment, he is doubting that God can do what God is saying he can do. Well, I'm going to go, and it all sounds great, but they're not actually going to believe me, because I'm not you, or because because uh, you can't really accomplish this, God. So, God does what he always does with sincere question askers. He gives him evidence. He gives him, first of all, the stick that will turn into a snake, the staff that will turn into a snake. And though know, I took a walk this morning down Lazy Daisy, and I was kind of like staring up in the trees, and, you know, I don't, I don't know, I was just kind of lost in thought. And I happened to look down right before I stepped on a snake. And I, I like, jumped backwards like this. You know, Moses, it says, like, leaped backwards. And I thought to myself, if God asked me to reach down and grab that thing by the tail, it, its head was flat. It wasn't alive. I thought it was at first, but it was run over. But uh, I thought, if God asked me to reach down and grab that thing, I really don't know that I could, even knowing it's dead, much less if it was alive. And so, uh, but Moses, you know, he at least has that much courage. But there's the, uh, the staff that will turn into a snake and then back into a staff. Now, Moses, I think, growing up in Egypt, really understands the, uh, the significance of these symbols. Snakes were a highly religious symbol in Egypt, both for good and evil. We think of snakes only as bad, but you know, the Pharaoh wore a cobra on his head as a religious symbol of his authority, and they have multiple snake gods, some of them evil, some of them good. They have stories about going to islands and talking to giant snakes who bless you, and you know, uh, snakes were really important to them. It's bizarre, isn't it? And so for Moses to have authority over a snake, I can turn a snake back into a staff, would have really spoken to the Egyptians. They would have understood that from a religious, whoever Moses is serving, he is a religious authority. And so 
So that's sort of that symbolism there. Next, God gives him the evidence of the hand. You know, he'd stick his hand into his bosom and it would turn to leprous and white. And then he'd stick it back in and it would turn back to normal. And so here you see sort of God's warning to them about how he has authority over plagues. Leprosy is kind of one of those, uh, those sickness plague kinds of things. The God, and they had a God who was over plagues in Egypt. You know, the God who, uh, who could control plagues could bring down a nation. That was kind of the idea. So for Moses to have control over when his hand was leprous and when it was not would have been very significant to them. And Moses knows this evidence that's convincing to him. And then, uh, and then finally, you have um, that he says in verse 9, It shall be if they do not believe even these two signs, or listen to your voice, that you shall take water from the river. Now, when you read about Egypt and you read the river, you should always pause and think, this is important, because the Nile was everything to them. When you take water from the river and pour it on the dry land, the water which you take from the river will become blood on the dry land. Now, Egyptians have lots of stories and fables about the Nile turning into blood in, time, in bad times um, that even predate Moses. And so, you know, this is, this is something they would have instantly understand. The Nile River was to them a god itself, and it was the god of life, right? That makes sense. Water brings, you know, plants and growth and life. They believed that when the Nile River was happy with them, it flooded. And when the Nile River was mad at them, it dried up. So if you can control the river, if you can control the, the god of life, as it were, to them, your god is much higher, is much better than that god. And we know that's one of the plagues that will happen, but before even that happens, he's doing this for the Israelites. These are signs to Moses to give to the Israelites, even just turning a little bit of it into blood. Right? And you think that's a, a Bible symbol, the life is in the blood, right? You know? And so he's saying, the river, the river is not life. Right? Life is truly in the blood, and God has control over both the river and the blood. And so Moses would have understood this, and that's, I think, what makes it more than just the fact that it's miraculous. That's convincing in of itself, but it's very rich with understanding uh, their culture. Moses would have got that because he was raised in it. And so, uh, so God helps him overcome his doubt that God can help him. Then in verse 10, Moses said to the Lord, O Lord, I am not eloquent neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Now, the New Testament says he was actually very eloquent, so I don't know if he's just lying or if he just doesn't believe in himself. Have you ever seen someone like, I'm so bad at this, and you're thinking, have you lost your mind? Do they really think they're bad at it? I don't know what Moses was doing, but there does seem to be a great deal of self-doubt here. And so God answers that in verse 11. Who has made man's mouth? And who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? And so the idea is, he is the creator God. Now, Egypt had a creator God. They had multiple of them. They had lots of weird stories. But God says, I'm the one who actually created everything. If I created you, surely I can make your mouth work properly, right? And so um, he goes back to, God goes back to himself to give Moses self-confidence. And that's the great myth of our culture is self-confidence comes from within you. If you believe in yourself enough, if you are strong enough yourself, if you dig down deep enough inside of you, you will find self-confidence. And people can make themselves feel confident for a little while like that, but something goes wrong, because you can't actually control everything, right? And your confidence all crumbles away. But in the Bible, whenever God builds someone else's confidence, he always builds it from who he is and how he sees them. I'm creator. I can help you. Verse 12, uh, the emphasis there is really on how God is the one who inspires people to speak his word, you know? I have a message that's worth speaking, and I will make sure that you speak it correctly. You, basically, it's a, you can't mess this up, Moses, right? Uh, like Melanie said in the beginning, I'm going to do this. You are the, the tool that gets to be a part of it, but I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to put the words in your mouth. You know, God's making it as easy as he can. But uh, then he continues. In verse 13, he said, Oh, my Lord, please send the hand of whomever else you may send. And so... Uh, in essence, he's, it's, I don't have any more excuses. I just don't want to do this. <laughs> but his fear of those who judges him is going to change. God says in verse 14, he says, I know the people that you fear. First, he was angry. Is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well. And look, he's also coming out to meet you. I can see him right now, even though I'm with you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. Right? You're afraid of what Aaron is going to think about you. Aaron's going to be happy to see you. I know the people that you're afraid of. 
Verse 15, I know the message that you must teach. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and I will teach you what you shall do. I know the people. I know the words. Verse 17, I'm the power behind you. Uh, um, I'm sorry, that's verse yeah, 17. I'm, I've got it all switched around. And I, 15 was the last one. 16, so, so he shall be your spokesman to the people, and he himself shall be as a mouth for you, and you shall be to him as God. So if you are as him to God, then what is God to Moses? Right? I'm the power behind all of this. And then finally, uh, verse 17, and you shall take this rod in your hand, and you shall do the signs. And so when you kind of put it all together, right, God got angry at him. Now what does Pharaoh do when he gets angry? He tries to kill Moses. He tries to kill all the Israelite boys. God gets angry at him. And he says, I am merciful, and I'm a problem solver. This is not exactly what God asked him to do in the beginning. Moses was supposed to do the speaking. But God is problem solving, and he's merciful. And he's showing just how very different from Pharaoh that he is. And so already, God against God, if you will, the real God is the one that's kind of standing out as the better God at this point. And Moses hasn't even gone on. Any, any comments on that real quick before we move on to the end of chapter 4? I say real quick, but we have time if you do have something to say. Yes. What's going on in that, or whether it's, you know, door knocking or whatever else, it's like, let somebody else do that. Or if it's teaching someone, hey, you know, let somebody else do that. Sure. I mean, I have the right words. What if I don't know the right scripture when they ask me a question? What if I can't answer the question if it, you know, somebody else needs to do that? Yes. Yeah. I'm not smart enough or good enough or, yeah, and that's, but maybe you're the only one with the opportunity. And if you have the opportunity, that Moses was the only one with this opportunity. And so if you have the opportunity, even if you don't feel good enough, it's the opportunity God has given you. And he doesn't help us with the miraculous like he did Moses today, but but he still works through providence to help us out, and so he will. And that's, you know, it's, it's teaching people. It, it can be any of God's commands. It can be, I have to go confess something to someone, and I would rather die than do that. You know, please let them figure out in some other way so I don't have to tell them. You know, it, just do what you have to do to obey God, and he will work all of that out. All right, we're going to wrap up real quick then in verses 18 to 31. And this is the, uh, uh, the second part of these chapters. It's, uh, as we fear change, it's, this one is about fear and commitment. And that's, uh, you know, if you've ever gotten married, you probably felt the fear of commitment, right? Fear of commitment or fear of him who kills those who won't commit. And that's, the Bible calls it double-minded. It's kind of the idea, James chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, describes the man who goes back and forth and back and forth. Psalm 119 and 113 talks about, you know, he says, I hate the double-minded, literally the two-souled man. He splits his soul in half. He's like he's two different people because he doesn't commit. And so um, in verses 18 through 31, we see Moses and others fearing to commit to God's word because they don't fear God enough yet. And so verse 18, we see it all appears good. Moses went, he returned to Jethro's father-in-law. He said to them, please let me go and return to my brethren who are in Egypt and see whether they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, go in peace. And so it all appears like Moses is committed to God at this point. It all seems good. And I think there's something important in what Jethro says. Go in peace. When we are fully committed to God, even if there's conflict around us, we have peace with God, and therefore we have that, you know, that peace that surpasses understanding. God works that peace out. And then in uh, verses 19, and or, yeah, verse 19, we see what God does. The Lord said to Moses and Midian, go return to Egypt, for all the men who sought your life are dead. So God has paved the way for this to have a peaceful resolution. Now, of course, they're going to go through the plagues, but he has paved the way for this to all end with peace. God is doing his part. Verses 20 through 23, uh, 21 through 20, or yeah, 20 through 23, just uh, real quickly, you see Moses has the appearance of commitment again. He took his wife, he set them on a donkey, he returned to the land of Egypt, he even took the rod. This is the rod that God gave me to perform miracles. Can't forget that, right? If you forget that, you turn around, you make a U-turn, you go home and you get it and you start over because you've got to have the rod. And, uh, and in verses 21 to 23, we see what God has done. When you go back to Egypt, see that you do all these wonders before Pharaoh that I've put in your heart. And he says, I know, Pharaoh is gonna, he's not gonna respond to my word appropriately. His heart is hard. He will not let the people go. And there's a lot of things we could say about that if we had time, but another time. Verse 22, he says, Thus says the Lord, 
Israel is my son. This is key. My firstborn. Keep that word in mind as we move forward. And uh, so I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn. So notice the relationship here. Israel is God's firstborn. If Pharaoh, who claims to be a god, won't release Israel, then God kills his firstborn. And we see that in that, that, that terrible plague where all the firstborn children die in Egypt. That literally happened. That is a really important thought as we get into verses 24 to 26, which are some of the most confusing verses to some people in all the Bible, because it's just such an odd story. It says, It came to pass on the way, at the encampment, that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. And so, you know, you're thinking, okay, God encourages him, God works, he problem solves with him, he gets angry, but they're all working it out. Moses looks like he's going to, he's gone to Egypt, it looks like he's doing exactly what God wanted him to do, and then it says God sought him to kill him. What is God thinking here? The question I think to understand this is, who or why in this context does God kill? Is he seeking to kill Moses? I don't think so, no. That's the assumption sometimes it's made, but I don't think so. You're on the right track there. Who is it in context, specifically verse 23, that God says he kills in this context? Firstborns, right? This don't obey me, the firstborn suffered. In this context, all right, so it says, that's actually the last word of verse 23, the firstborn. And I think that's what he's talking about. It came to pass that he sought him, he met him and sought to kill him, the firstborn son of Moses. Now why? That's what verse 25 is about. Then Zipporah, that's his wife. She sounds like a kind of makeup, I think. Zipporah took a sharp stone and she cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at now, the New King James says Moses' feet, but I think, I think there, you notice the word Moses is in italics. I don't think that she's actually casting it at Moses' feet. And even the word cast, if you, you probably have a footnote that says made it touch, that's really more the idea of the word is she put it on, I think, Gershom, his, old, his firstborn son's feet. And that was a symbolic thing to them. Uh, not all people circumcised in ancient times, but some peoples, and probably the Midianites, would circumcise a person right before they got married. And so instead of being a birth thing, covenant with God, it was a marriage thing, a covenant with your in-laws. And you would get circumcised, and they would have a phrase that they say, and we'll read that in a moment, and then they would touch their feet is a euphemism for a different part of the body, but they would touch the foreskin to their feet, and that was the ritual that they would do to build this covenant. And so it says she touched the feet and said, Surely you are a husband, or that's really a close kinsman is what that means, a husband of blood to me. And the result is, God let him go because she said, you are a husband of blood concerning the circumcision. And so uh, the translation makes it a little bit difficult, but essentially what you're looking at is, God says, if Pharaoh will not let my firstborn son go, I kill his firstborn son. But then what is it that all Israelites from the time of Abraham are supposed to do to their sons? on day eight of life. Circumcise them. Now, Gershom is older than eight days old, but he's not circumcised yet. And I think you get the idea that Moses, or that God is saying, you are going to Egypt, you say that you're doing everything you're supposed to do, but your son is not even in a covenant with me yet. He's not even entered that covenant. And so how can you go be the leader of my people if you're not keeping my covenant, if you aren't even that committed? And that's you know, I don't know if Moses is thinking he's going to go and see how it works, but he wants his son to be uncircumcised just in case it doesn't go well. Maybe Pharaoh will take his son in, but Pharaoh won't take a circumcised kid. Right? Maybe, maybe he's playing the odds or, or hedging his bets. I, you know, I don't know all that Moses is thinking, but for whatever reason, he has yet to circumcise his son, and God is saying, <coughs> it can't be like that if you're going to be my leader. You've got to commit now. Thankfully, he had a wife who was willing to make that commitment for him, and sometimes I think there's a lot of men who are saved by the example and the work that their wife does. Uh, they've got to follow it, but, you know, their uh, wives sometimes get men out of a lot of pickles when it comes to, to following God. And so uh, uh, it's a very odd story, but I think that, that that's what you're looking at. In fact, it was Genesis 17 that we looked at this morning where this covenant was established about circumcision, and Moses hasn't followed it. And their children were much more unclothed than our children typically. You know, they tended to play a lot more uh, freely or less clothed than our children do in public. 
And so if his son is not circumcised, and he's with all the Israelites, and they all, all the kids go out to play, and he's the only one, and it's like, that's the leader's son. What does that tell the people about Moses? Who follows a man like that, you know? They're not going to want to follow him if he won't even keep the covenant with God. And so God knows it's important that Moses gets this all worked out before he gets there. And then finally, verses 27 to 31, we uh, kind of come back to the crowds, not from Moses' perspective, but from the Israelites' perspective. Verse 27, Aaron comes just like God said he did. Verses 28 to 30, Aaron agrees to speak just like God said he would. Verse 31, the people believe just like God said that he would. And so Moses sees. God said it. It all works out. And the question that the chapter kind of ends with is, whose track record is worth keeping to, who, attending to? Whose track weather record makes him the one to follow, Pharaoh or God? And I love how it ends in verse 31. They bowed their heads and they worshiped. And so, you know, big picture. Sometimes life is full of changes, especially changes that the Bible requires of us that we are afraid to make for a number of reasons, either because we don't trust God, we think we're not good enough, or because we're afraid of what other people will think of us. But if we will just trust God and fear him more than those things, God will work it all out. And that's really what chapter 4 is about. Sometimes it's difficult the way he works it out. You know, he came to kill Moses' oldest son, right? Sometimes God works it out in difficult ways in the moment, but he always works it out for good in the end. All right, any last thoughts or comments? We still have a couple minutes. I don't know how we did that. I think this is still a good example. God has never changed. He right. can't rule. You have to follow to stay in good relationship with him. Just like when Christ came, yes. he set up rules to stay in good relationship. If you don't follow him, you're not in good relationship. Right, yeah. He, he's always, this, I think, you know, of all places in the Bible, this really emphasizes, I am, you know. I always have been. I always will be. I am in every moment. Just exactly who I always have been. And so his covenant might change, but he doesn't. And so as long as we know what he requires of us, because he doesn't change, we always know exactly what to do. And we always know that he's not going to just change his mind one day and say, you know, I used to say this is what I wanted, but not anymore. So, you know, tough luck for you. And he just is consistent. And he always gives us his blessings that he promises us. All right, we will end there today. Thank you so much for your attention and your comments. And um, I know we blew through that. We will actually move this class to Wednesday nights in September. And so Exodus is moving back to its, its rightful home on Wednesday nights. And on Sunday mornings, uh, the second week of September, second Sunday of September, we'll start studying Philippians in this class. So um, things to look forward to. Question. Do you see um, That's the Philippians Yes, uh -huh. yeah, there's, there's a, that's Sunday morning, yeah, Wednesday night, we'll keep you on here, I can read on Wednesday night.